Faith runs deep like a river through Appalachia, and the water's wide, filled with a diverse mix of Christian faiths, dozens of different Pentecostal and holiness churches, and upwards of 80 separate Baptist faiths, each with its own unique tradition. But what they all share is a fundamental faith in the Word of God and a strong belief in the right to religious freedom. This is the story of one of those homegrown churches and its hundred year long fight to be allowed to practice what they preach. In small churches scattered through the mountains, speaking in tongues, drinking poison, and handling deadly serpents or sacred rites of worship. These men and women follow the literal word of God as set down in the book of Mark. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. There's nothing goes on in this church that's not taken from the Bible. We don't add no rules or nothing. If it's not in the Bible, then we don't accept it. For the last 100 years, these true believers, known as science followers, have endured derision and risked arrest, jail, and even death to practice their beliefs. I am going to do what the laws of God is, and that's to take up servants if I want to take up servants. If I believe, I'll do it. Snake handlers are an extreme example of a hallowed Appalachian tradition, homegrown, fiercely independent churches that answer to no one but God. This tradition was born on the wild Appalachian frontier in the 1700s. Traveling preachers set up tents and invited all comers to join in raucous emotional communions. These emotionally uplifting experiences inspired communities to hold their own grassroots services. By 1900, Appalachia was home to hundreds of independent, non-denominational churches. Simple and unpretentious, they were as humble as the hill folk themselves. That fiercely democratic spirit lives on in today's mountain churches. If somebody's preaching against something and somebody doesn't like it, they go down the road to another building or build a little building and form another church. So it's real easy to do. That's how the snake handlers got their start a century ago. The mountains are thick with venomous snakes, and the Bible is full of references to deadly serpents. For one mountain man, this was no coincidence. It was a sign from God. In 1910, 30-year-old George Hensley, an ex-moonshiner, was studying the Bible to reform his sinful ways. The story goes that he went out walking in the mountains of eastern Tennessee, ruminating over the meaning of those disturbing verses in the book of Mark. And he was struggling and, 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 and prayerfully meditating on the gospel of Mark when suddenly there a rattlesnake appeared, and a, a fortuitous event, and Hensley picked it up and was amazed that he could handle it just exactly like the text said. It was a revelation, man enacting God's will on earth. You're in the mountains, you see a, a serpent there, and if you believe it strong enough, you just go up there and pick him up, it won't hurt you. I think that's pretty powerful. Uh, the Word of God is powerful. Hensley began handling snakes in churches and revivals throughout the region. The practice caught on, and by the 1940s, the exuberant services were attracting thousands. At the time, with big outside companies increasingly controlling the land and people's lives in cold towns, the traditional fabric of mountain culture was being ripped apart. Strong religious faith helped hold it together. Sharing in forms of worship they themselves had created, the mountain people could find meaning in a world termed topsy-turvy.
1955, at a revival in this makeshift barn church in Florida, George Hensley was bitten by a large rattler and died the next day. The coroner listed his death as suicide, but the faithful believed Hensley was in the hands of a higher power. No one who picks up a venomous snake doubts the danger. Dewey Chafin belongs to the oldest signs following church, located in Jolo, West Virginia. He began handling snakes in 1954, and his scars show just how seriously he takes the risk. And then that one, and then there, and this, throw this thumb in here. They, this year, this, there's more pain than this snake I've ever had on anything. Dude's been bit 168 times, or 170 times. He'd been bit with black rattlers, yellow rattlers, copperheads, uh, cotton mouths, and God's took care of him every time. Dewey has nearly died many times over from venom poisoning. He's never received medical treatment, and he's always recovered. Many have not been so blessed. More than 100 people have died from snake bites during religious services. In the 1940s, a rash of deaths led the state of Tennessee to ban the practice. Georgia, North Carolina, and Virginia followed suit. Over the next 20 years, police repeatedly raided mountain churches and revivals trying to stamp out what the authorities considered a dangerous, even deviant practice. But the handlers refused to back down and kept right on with their worship, defying the authorities. In the Appalachian Mountain, yeah, the, the more fundamentalist traditions would say that man's laws are fine, but they never can supersede God's laws. The struggle with the law came to a head in 1961 in West Virginia when Dewey Chafin's sister was bitten during a service and died. In response, West Virginia lawmakers proposed legislation to outlaw snake handling. Still grieving, Dewey's family decided they must act. Dewey's family went to Charleston. And, and, and they was up for a long time at talking to them people and, and convincing them that's our our right. They, we came out of here. For God come out of here. As far as the state was concerned, the law was not passed in serving handling. West Virginia is still the only state where snake handlers can practice without breaking the law. Today, only about 2,000 attend snake handling churches compared to more than three million Southern Baptists and Pentecostals. Appalachians don't like people to think that Appalachia is full of serpent handlers, right? They don't want to be defined by serpent handling. But what they do do that a lot of other places don't do is they respect diversity and respect the handlers. None of them would be opposed to the serpent healing church being here, but none of them would support the practice. However small in numbers, the snake handlers are a potent symbol of the unshakable spirit of religious freedom and tolerance shared by the mountain people. <laughs>